And so we're going to be diving into 1 Timothy today. And I just want to, as we're setting all of this up in the next few weeks, I just want to give you a framework. And here's the key verse. And we don't find it in chapter 1 or 2, but we find it in chapter 3. And so this is Paul writing, and he says, Although I hope to come to you soon, so he's speaking to Timothy, this pastor. He says, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Why is this important for us today? It's important because I believe that many people have embraced false doctrine in the church, especially here in America. We're taking our cues from culture instead of from the kingdom of God. And so what we find is that many times people come into church and they don't know how to conduct themselves in the household of God. They don't know how to conduct themselves in the church. And this is something that you must understand is that the church is called to be the pillar and foundation of truth. I believe that in every city, every local church should be a pillar and it should be the foundation of truth in that city. That when people come, that they're not hearing about entertainment. We're not just hearing about events. We're not just hearing about somebody's ideology or ideas. That They are hearing the truth of God's word, that Jesus is clearly being presented as the one who is their hope, that we are unmovable, we're unshakable as a pillar, that we need to be strong in these times. And this is exactly what God is calling them to do. So as a church and speaking to us collectively as a church, as Hub City Church, but also as the big C church, speaking of the American church, the global church, that we should always be a people that are more about substance over style. Listen, we do lights, but if you took away the lights, the gospel would still be preached here. We do music and I love our music and I love how loud it is. But if you took all of that away, it's not so much about our style that has grown this church. I believe it's that people have come and experienced the transformative power of the gospel in this church that has been more about substance over style, even though we can do what we do because it's what we like. Some people go, why do you guys have those bright lights? Because Pastor Steve likes lights, man. I believe that we are a vibrant people and that this is an expression of who we are. Some people like dark rooms. Some people like very light rooms. Some people like crosses and steeples and others don't. Here's the thing is you can have your sense of style, but there's always has to be substance. And there's only one person that is that substance his name is Jesus. Come on. We have to be a people that are about truth over trends. There's a lot of church planting strategies and people have all these ideas about what church should be and the trends. And we're going to do this. We're going to do that. But at the end of the day, that as a church, if we are going to be a pillar and we're going to be a place that we are a, a rock, we're a foundation of truth in our community, we cannot be moved by trends. We have to be anchored in truth. And not only that, it's always got to be Christ over culture. Always. It's always got to be Christ over culture. And so that, that's why this is so important that we get this today. And so in this study, what, we've, what we're going to uncover is seven things that the church should be. And last week I talked about that we should be a place of sound doctrine. And so we're going to continue that today. We're going to finish up this thought on sound doctrine, and we're going to introduce another pillar next Sunday. But today I, I want to pick up where we left off, and we're going to pick up in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Okay, so remember this, the command that Paul gave to Timothy is he said, you need to stay there. Where was there in Ephesus? Remember that last week? He said, you need to stay there. And he says, and you need, and he commanded him to confront these people that were preaching or teaching false doctrines. He says, you need to stay there for certain people who are preaching false doctrines. So this command, he's saying, the reason I told you to stay there, the reason that I told you to confront these people, he says, the goal of this command is love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So understand that the motivation of Paul writing this letter and even saying, I want you to confront these guys, it was because he was loving them well. I want you to know that one of the most loving things you can do for people is to tell them the truth. One of the most loving things you can do for people is to tell them the truth. And so Paul was doing this, but he did it in a way that I believe that we can take the cues from Scripture and it would greatly improve our relationships, improve our effectiveness in preaching the gospel. How did he do it? He did it with a pure heart. He did it with a good conscience and a sincere faith. And as I was pressing in this week, I said, God, what is it that you want us to see from this? What are you highlighting? What do we need to know? And what he kept bringing up is the word conscience. And as I look through the the scriptures in 1 Timothy, this is a constant theme. It's a constant theme, the idea of conscience. You know, we see in 
1 Timothy 1, 5, as you just saw, that he talks about a good conscience. Also in verse 19, he talks about a good conscience. In, in, in chapter 3, verse 9, he talks about a clear conscience. And also in 1 Timothy 4, 1, he talks about a seared conscience. And so we're going to kind of unpack this idea of having a good conscience. And that's actually the title of today's message is a good conscience. You know, when it comes to people trying to explain a good conscience to us, how many of you guys remember the old cartoon with the little devil on one shoulder with the pitchfork? And then you had a little angel on this side, right? And, and we go, oh, that's our conscience. It's like the good guy and the bad guy. And the one going, do it, do it. And the good guy said, no, don't do it, don't do it. You know, and, and it's going back and forth. Well, that's kind of fun when we see it as a cartoon, but that's not reality. The reality is that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that, that we are not you know, ruled by a little devil on the shoulder and a little angel on the other shoulder with a, a halo, that we are ruled by the Holy Spirit. That when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and he invades your space. He comes and he dwells inside of you and I. He makes his power, he makes his knowledge, he makes everything that he is. And remember, the Holy Spirit is God, okay? He's not some, you know, lower level, you know, angel. No, he is God. And so he resides in us in that power. Everything that he brings, he makes accessible to you and I. And that is the driving force in our lives, that that becomes our conscience, that the Holy Spirit is the one that motivates us. He's the one that gives us direction. He's the one that goes, ah, 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 don't say that. How many of you guys have trouble with your mouth sometimes? Come on, let's be real in this place. Yeah, in that little voice inside going, I really shouldn't say this because it's going to pour fuel on the fire, right? But you do it anyways. Come on, yo. Is anybody else live with Pastor Steve? And he's like, both hands are up, both feet. Come on. And, and some of us, we do struggle with this. But understand that it is the Holy Spirit that comes to dwell inside of us that really becomes the conscience that motivates us and drives us. Listen to what John 16, 13 says. It's, it says this. John 16, 13. There we go. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into what? All the truth. Some translations say all truth, that that is his purpose, that he comes, he dwells inside of us, and he is leading you to all truth. But when it comes to a good conscience, I want to define this according to the word of God, and I want you to understand what good actually is. See, because there's a lot of people that, you know, we live in postmodern thought where there is no moral absolutes, that some people, they use the term good to their advantage. But Understanding that the Bible is actually very clear on what good is. You know, in, in Mark chapter 10, 18, Jesus addresses this. He says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. See, this is one of the issues that atheists have is that when they, they're, oh, I just want to be a good person. They want to be a good person, but they want to be an atheist at the same time. But where does your moral standard come from? See, we understand according to God's word here is that good only comes from God. So that, that's one of the quandaries that they find themselves in because at the end of the day, they just go in circles and they can never answer the question because they're trying to actually separate good from God, but you can't. And so we understand that everything that is good in our lives, everything, including a good conscience, is actually comes from God. But what does it mean to have a good conscience? Well, the Greek, when you go to the Greek, it's interesting because the word conscience, it's actually broken up as derivative of two words, is soon and ito. And what soon means is with or together. Okay, it's where we get sunidasis. With or together. And ito is to see or to know. So it's with, with together or together to know. And so the vines defines it as this, a co-knowledge with oneself and God. And really the easiest way to put this is that you have a self-awareness that is active with God. Okay, let me just say that. You have a self-awareness that's active with God, that you know who you are, you know whose you are, you know what God's called you to do, you know God's plan, and you're actively pursuing what's important to him. That you've determined in your heart that at all costs, I'm gonna agree with what he says is right, I'm gonna agree with what he says is wrong, and I'm gonna walk, lock, and step with my God. And so this is so important that we get this because that is a good conscience, is that inside that you realize that everything good has come from God into my life and, and understand that I can trust him because everything that he does is good and everything that he's going to do is good. And I'm going to walk in accordance with his ways. And why is this important to us, especially when it comes to sound doctrine, is because a clear conscience is the byproduct of choosing what is right over what is easy. 
Let me say that again, that a clear conscience is the byproduct of choosing what is right over what is easy. See, this is why the church has found itself in the condition that it's in, where we have LBGTQ and all those things creeping in, and we've got pastors that are preaching things that are complete heresy, things that are complete, you know, false doctrine. Feminism has crept into the church. We have racism that's crept into the church. We have all this stuff that's crept into the church that is not meant to be in the church. Those are worldly things. And we're embracing these things and we're actually preaching these things in the name of tolerance and that the gate is wide and, the, and that we need to be inclusive. But the reality is the Bible doesn't talk about that, that every religion has a narrow path. The beauty of Christianity is that it welcomes all in onto the path. Which you have people that have lost their way and they've gone in their own direction. Why? Because many pastors have stood in these pulpits and they're more concerned with doing what's easy instead of doing what's right. And when you are not walking in step with what the Holy Spirit is speaking, you will find yourself in that quandary every single time. But people that have a good conscience, they're ruled by principle and not by their emotions. They're ruled by principle. They're ruled by the Spirit of God. They have a set of rules and guidelines that they live their life by, and they're not just pushed around. They're not blown around by whatever's popular today. And that's what you see happening in the church. And that's why this is so important that you understand what a good conscience is. But Paul also talks about a different type of conscience that I want to talk to you about today. And in 1 Timothy 4.2, he says this. He says, some teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Some harsh words there. Some harsh words. He calls them hypocritical liars. And you're like, wow, he's talking about pastors. He's talking about teachers. He's talking about leaders in the church being hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared. They've been burned as with a hot iron. Have you, ever, have you ever burned your fingers? Anybody ever burned your fingers on an iron or a skillet or something? And it hurts like heck at first, right? But then as it begins to heal, you end up with these, you know, kind of calluses. And you're like, oh man, I can't feel there like I once did. What's well, the same thing is that you have to be careful because if you are not pursuing a good conscience, you can slip into the place of having a seared conscience. And what is a seared conscience? It's being numb to the voice of the Lord. It's being numb to what is right and what is wrong. It's being numb to actually even having standards in your life that you can't call anything good, you can't call anything bad. Have you ever watched these you know, YouTube channels, you watch TikTok and you listen to these young people being interviewed and nobody can stand up for anything today? Because they're afraid, oh, if I say this, I'm going to be called racist. If I say this, I'm homophobic. If I say this, then I'm this. I'm transphobic. If I say this. And so it is silenced people from actually standing up for the truth. But if you're driven by a good conscience, you'll just tell the truth no matter what in a loving way. You know what? I'm sorry that you don't agree with me, but this is just the way I feel. And you're entitled to the way that you feel and think just as much as I am in my own. And you don't lose your cool. You're not out there fighting people. You're not out there losing you know, your mind because you're driven by a good conscience. But there are many people in the church today that actually their conscience has been seared. And how is your conscience seared? How do you become numb to the voice of God? Many times it's just through consistently disobeying or ignoring him. I love what Pastor Joel used to say. I just thought of this this morning. He used to say that I don't want to spirit. <laughs> the I don't want to spirit. And I think that sometimes the Holy Spirit is speaking to some of you and he's saying, you should probably stop watching that, but I don't want to. You should probably stop hanging out with those people. Yeah, but I don't, I don't really feel like I want to do that. And you keep ignoring his voice. You keep ignoring his voice. You keep putting it off. Well, you know what? I'll deal with it or I'll tackle that tomorrow. You know, I'll, I'll get into CR next week and, and deal with my sobriety. You know, I'll get into freedom and deal with my unforgiveness like later. You know, I just, I'll deal with that when I got time. And you keep ignoring the voice of God. You keep ignoring the voice of God. And after a while, that voice, like you don't really hear it anymore. And then all of a sudden, you're just kind of just living and doing your thing. But you're not living in the fruit of righteousness. You've lost your peace. You've lost your joy. And you can't understand why. It's usually because you're living with a seared conscience. The Holy Spirit is speaking and he's speaking and he's speaking. And this is why 1 Timothy, as we continue in this passage in 6 and 7, he talks about a certain kind of people. And he says, some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. What is he talking about when he's saying they departed from these? What's the these? Well, Paul, if you remember, he says, I gave you these commands in love, right? And he talked about having a pure heart. 
He talked about a good conscience. He talked about a sincere faith. What he's saying is these people are departing from a pure heart. They're departing from a good conscience. They're departing from a sincere faith. And what have they done? They've turned to meaningless talk. I need to address a few things in this series with you guys. I'm keeping it real with you. One of the things that is really, and some of you parents, you need to understand this. Young people, hear me out. Young adults in this place, teenagers, hear me out. Okay, there's a trend now that people are departing from the faith. They're departing from a sincere faith in pursuit of who knows what. They're departing from a good conscience to pursue their own thing. And there's this trend in the church. We'll use this word out there where we talked about deconstructing our faith. Have you guys heard that terminology? terminology. It's like, well, I'm just, you know, I was raised in church and I got hurt in the church and the pastors stole the money and this and that. And my mom and dad made us go to church and I hated that. And what they're doing is they use this term, we're deconstructing our faith, meaning that they're, they're doing away with what they were taught. They're doing away with all that they've known to pursue something else, to, to depart from these things from a sincere faith, from a good conscience, from a pure heart. And what are they doing? Usually it's rooted in offense. It's like, I'm mad about this, man. I'm mad about that. And they've allowed that that anger inside of them. They've allowed that brokenness. They've allowed that bitterness to fester to the point where they have now embraced a seared conscience. And they don't know what's right and wrong. And they've left. And let me just say this, that when it comes to the church, you can come against the church and do whatever you want. But I'm going to tell you that God loves his church. I want you to understand that the church is God's idea. And you can't hate the church and love Jesus at the same time because you can't hate what he loves. My friend, this is his idea. You have to understand this. And when you have these young people going, well, I don't need to go to church anymore because I'm still a Christian. I read my Bible. I watch online. But understand that is actually anti-biblical. Somebody needs to tell you the truth. The Bible says to not forsake the gathering of the brethren. How how much clearer does it need to be? But yet we embrace what culture pushes. We embrace what teachers that are teaching false doctrine teach people that have seared consciences. They are not trying. They tell you with their words that I'm leading you closer to God. That if you get outside of the church, you move into isolationism. You start doing it your way that somehow you're going to find a way where you find yourself closer to God. But many times you don't hear them saying closer to Jesus. You hear them saying closer to God. And actually their God is themselves. And so they find themselves closer to themselves, loving their own ideas, loving their own ways, but not loving the true God who is Jesus Christ himself. Understand that in the church, God has ordained and instituted this institution. It's so valuable to him because it is his body. He is the head and he mobilizes the body. When you start to fragment and disconnect yourself from the body, you become like an arm or an ear or a hand just laying around on a counter somewhere, not being useful. There's so many people that say, oh yeah, well, I'm just, I've been feeling like I'm more useful now that I've been in the kingdom. Well, who are you preaching to? Who, who, who have you been sharing the gospel with? Who's gotten saved as a result of you being disconnected from the church? How, how much closer and how much stronger do you feel in your faith by being by yourself, by staying home on Sundays, being disconnected? Guys, I'm keeping it real with you because a lot of pastors won't. Guys, this is so important. And so people have, de- they've departed. They've departed. And the sad thing is, is that in that departing, they've lost their way. See, God doesn't call you to depart. He calls you to turn. He says, turn to me. He's not saying to depart. And so we shouldn't be blaming and shaming the church. As a matter of fact, we should be thanking God that he's given us a way to heal and to be restored and to find wholeness within the confines of the church. And so then he goes on and he says this in 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. He says, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and the rebels, the ungodly and the sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexual and moral, for, the pra- for those practicing homosexuality, for the slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. Guys, you know, you'll hear people these days, you know, just go online. God never says anything about homosexuality. God never says anything about slavery. God never says anything. It's right here. You guys seen it in the Bible? Are you seen it in the Bible? And so you have people that are spewing false doctrine, false teaching, and believers are just believing it hook, line, and sinker. Oh yeah, you know what? It's just all about just being inclusive and loving. Listen, we love people 
And, and you, you don't, just because you disagree with somebody or you have a diff, different viewpoint doesn't mean you don't love them. Do you realize that these people with these minds, they've educated people to think that if somebody disagrees with you, that they hate you. That's why I have these little kids running around and you try to correct them and they're like, I hate you, mom. Where does that come from? That's from the spirit of the devil himself. It's a rebellious spirit that bucks against truth. That parents, you know, Veronica and I, we were at Disneyland with our grandkids uh, this past weekend, and, and our whole goal is just to keep them alive. Come on. You know, we're running around. It's like, no, don't put your hand in that machine. It's going to chop it off. Hey, don't, you know, go over there and fall on your head and, you know, ruin the day. And now we're in the emergency room getting stitches. Here's the thing is that God and being led by the spirit, having a good conscience, hearing what he's saying and doing what he's saying, it is for our benefit. It keeps us safe. And when we heed the voice of God and when we follow strong, clear, truthful doctrine that is from the word of God, it keeps us safe. When we get outside of those guidelines, when we start, you know, thinking, oh, oh that's just so mean. It's just so mean. Well, what you're doing is you're being ruled by your feelings and not by your principles, my friend need to tell you the truth. And so he lists all of these things that, that have really, the, the church is facing. These are things that they're battling. These are things that, they're, that have crept in. And you know what the truth is? Is that we're no different. We're no different. You know, we, we have false teachers with seared consciences that have crept into the church across America, promising to lead people closer to God, but doing the complete opposite. People who in the name of tolerance, they pollute the pulpit and they spew half-truths that contradict the truth of God's word. They teach what scripture calls doctrines of demons. And you can find that in 1 Timothy 4.1. Their conscience has been seared and they can no longer discern what is right and wrong according to the Lord. Guys, this is so important that we get this. There was a, there was a pastor many, many years ago. His name was Jim Baker. The guy just was a complete mess, had affairs on his wife, stole money from the ministry, did all this stuff, literally ended up in prison. And I remember a, an interview, and the interviewer said, when did you lose your love for God? And he said, I never lost my love for God. I lost my fear of God. And here's the thing is that when you have a seared conscience, you, you can say, I love you, Jesus. I go to church. I do my thing. But but you can lose your fear of God because when he keeps speaking to you, you can lose your, your respect for him. You can lose your honor for him if you're not careful. So what I'm saying is that God wants to lead you with a good conscience, but be wary or beware if you are battling and succumbing to the pressures of a seared conscience, my friend. Let me ask you this question today. Is there an area that the Holy Spirit has been checking you on and you've been ignoring it? Guys, don't ignore it. Not one more day, not one more second, not one more moment. Whatever it is that he's speaking to you, you enter into the realm of a good conscience by walking in accordance to his ways, doing it his way. And being willing to just say, God, I'm really bitter with so-and-so. They completely messed me over, but you know what? Your word has called me to forgive them. And I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I need your help, but would you help me? For some of you, you're battling some addictive behaviors you're battling some things that, that you, you know, secrets, things that people don't know about. And the Holy Spirit keeps just saying lovingly, gently, just don't do that. Come on. You, you, you know better. You know better. And you keep ignoring that voice. I'm just telling you today, what, what is it that has brought you to a place of, of having that seared conscience? Are there lies that you've been believing? Have you become more political than kingdom minded? Are you, are you somebody that, that has, has really embraced all the buzzwords with feminism and all this stuff it creeping into the church because it just makes you feel good that you just feel like you're going with the trends and what's popular? You have to be willing to submit everything to God. That is the way of living in, in, with a good conscience, that you submit everything to him and you just simply ask yourself that question, God, is there something that I'm ignoring that you keep trying to reach me with? And with that submissive spirit, guys, it's going to unleash life and life more abundantly for you. So let me just share two things as we close out. What is our response? What's our responsibility? Number one is this, is that you have to own your own conscience. You have to own your own conscience. You have to repent for the areas that you've grown numb in. And listen to what Romans 8, 14 says. It says, for those who are led by the spirit of God or the children of God, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, I want you to know that that should become your mission, to be led by the Spirit of God, because you are a child of God. 
that whatever he says is what you're going to do. doesn't matter if it makes sense to you or not. It doesn't matter if it fits your feelings. It doesn't matter if it fits your ideology. Whatever it is that he says, because I'm a child of God, that I'm going to be led by his spirit. But you've got to own your conscience. What is it that he's calling you to do? Because we always start with ourselves first before we try to take the message to somebody else. Why? Because your life preaches. My life preaches. What we do and what we say and the way we conduct ourselves, it preaches very, very loud to the people around us. And so we got to deal with ourselves first. The second thing is this, is that, that I have to stand firm. I have to be willing to stand firm. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says. It says, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Why is this important? Because we're living in a generation where people are going off the rails. The church in many ways, not every church, there are a lot of good churches around here, but there are others that have embraced things that are not of God. And we have to be willing to stand firm in the faith. What does stand firm mean? It means that you are intentional about not moving from where you are. And to stand firm in this time, you're gonna have to be courageous. Some of you are gonna have to pray that God would make you brave. That in order to speak truth to your children when they come home and say, well, my friend was saying this and my teacher was saying that, then they head off to college to be indoctrinated with a bunch of nonsense. You're gonna have to be willing to do the front work and be courageous and be strong for them as they are growing up and maybe they're not strong enough to stand for themselves. But here's something that you need to understand. One of the things when it comes to standing firm is that we live in a culture today that says that all roads lead to heaven. That you just do you that you do whatever feels good to you, that it's all love, it's all peace, my friend. And the, the beating that the church takes is that the church is not inclusive, that the church is narrow-minded, that the church is out of date, that the church has all these rules and regulations and you're just kind of cramping my style because I believe that I'm supposed to be living my best life right now. That's a lie from the pit of hell, my friend. Your best life is in paradise, which is to come. And everything that happens in between is for God's purposes. So you get, you're gonna go through some tough times. You're gonna go through some challenges. You're gonna face sickness. You're gonna face poverty. You, you face all these things, but understanding that our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in eternity through Jesus Christ. And if you're believing a lie that this is heaven now, you're missing it, my friend. That's bad doctrine, it's bad theology. But the bigger problem is that a lot of people just believe that all roads lead to heaven, all religions lead to heaven. You just do it your way and somehow we're all gonna arrive there. Here's the reality and let me help you understand this. Veronica and I, we, we traveled quite a bit last month. We're in this airport in St. Louis. And man, if you ever been to St. Louis airport, man, it's a big airport. And we get off of a plane and, um, and I'm thinking like, man, like this, we got off and I'm thinking like, well, it should just be like right here where we get on our plane heading to Ontario. And that's not what it was. We were walking and walking and walking. Have you ever been on that walk? Like, it just seems like you're walking so far. You're like, this has to be wrong, right? So this person's there and I'm kind of looking and, and I'm just seeing like where they're going. And, 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 I, and I remember asking for directions like, hey, like, is this the way? And, and of course they lead you that way. They're like, oh no, it's still up there, it's still up there. And that gave me hope because then I was like, well, at least I'm going the right direction. But what if they were in the name of inclusivity and tolerance and being loving, they just said, hey, you know what? You can get on any plane. It's gonna get you home. You just choose wherever you want. It's gonna, you'll, you'll get there. Because they didn't wanna disappoint me because I had a longer walk, but they wanted to be kind to me. So then I just get on whatever plane, instead of getting to gate C-17, I jump on, you know, on B, B-32 and jump on a plane and end up somewhere else. I'll tell you what, I'd be really frustrated to land somewhere else at a different destination. But they were so loving and so kind to point me to a narrow road, to point me to a narrow gate, to a place that actually led me home. And guys, I just want you to understand that in this culture, you're gonna hear a lot about how you can get to God. You're gonna hear a lot about how you can find your way home, but there's only one way home and it's through Jesus Christ himself. And we have to learn to embrace that. Even if it doesn't feel good, it doesn't line up with the way that you've been taught or the ideas of the people around you. And to follow sound doctrine is to follow a very, very narrow road. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, 13, he says, enter through the what? The narrow, the narrow gate. The narrow gate leads you home, my friend. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. 
Listen, there are more that will just enter on any gate and end up at the wrong destination. But there's a narrow gate that leads to truth and it leads you to the presence of God. And that's what we want to be. Did God speak to you today?